My name is Suzanne Paulson. I'm the CEO and the founder of iEco. And I'm really happy that you're joining us today because we've got some extraordinary information that we're going to share on how you can step it up in the management of your moderate to severe MGD patients. With me today is an absolutely incredible panel of dry eye experts, the brightest minds in the industry. And I'm sure they're familiar names to all of you, but I'm, they deserve introduction. Dr. Laura Perriman, ophthalmologist out of Seattle, Washington, who is just a, uh, everybody knows Dr. Perriman. She's so passionate about dry eye, decades of experience. We also have um, Dr. Leslie O'Dell, who is the medical director of Medical Optometry America out of New Freedom, Pennsylvania. And of course, Leslie, Dr. O'Dell has a long standing history of dedication to dry eye patients, as well as Dr. Crystal Brimer, just the same. She's the founder of the Dry Eye Institute out of Wilmington, North Carolina and has the equal amount of passion for treating dry eye patients. We also will have shortly Dr. Amy Now, who is of course the partner of Corbin Associates. And we just can't wait for you to, to, to hear what we have to say. It's gonna be divided into two sections. We're gonna have Dr. Zodell and Brimer go through some really exciting new clinical mm. research on pearls that you wanna be able to really take away in the management of your MGD. Uh, patients moderate and severe at home, as well as other, the second half is going to be Drs. Perriman and now with some real insight to some of the really big missings that you do when you're, it's the things to look for when you're looking at your moderate to severe MGD patients that can make an amazing difference in the quality of their life. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it off with Drs. Odell and Dr. Brimer. Um, Dr. Odell, you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much. Um, it's exciting always to be able to present alongside these wonderful doctors. So we appreciate you, Suzanne, for bringing us together and helping us raise awareness around the importance of at-home care for our patients. This really has evolved, um, you know, from my time first thinking and speaking around my Bohmian gland dysfunction. I can remember actually encouraging some of these behaviors that you see on the left-hand side of this slide. I would tell patients in order to heat their eyes properly that they should boil an egg and put it on their eye, which now I think about as, you know, this completely absurd thing. But at the time I thought, you know, like many people, it's the shape of your eye. And um, what we didn't know was who knows how hot that egg was getting, you know, and what kind of temperature we were seeing. The same is true with the boiled potato, rice in a sock. You know, these were all things that we had to do before um, masks that are microwavable or gel-based became um, available for our patients. So we were trying our best with the materials we had. <laughs> well, and Leslie, I think there's doctors out there who still recommend that. And so this is going to be good information for all of us. Um, I think sometimes the doctor themselves wants to see the differentiation between the mask and understand it. But even when we do understand it, some of us are struggling with how to make that case for the patient so that they are not using something they bought off of Amazon or um, found at Marshall's last week. I've had some really crazy things be brought into the office before. <laughs> but, uh, but so that's one of our goals today is to kind of give you the ammunition to have this discussion and to um, and be able to differentiate between the mask with your patients. And I think it really comes down to understanding where temperature lies and why temperature is so important. Even if you think about that slide that we just showed and the, the wet, um, the warm compress with the washcloth, that's the one I probably hear most often from doctors. If I'm seeing a patient, you know, new to me for dry eye, they might be doing just a warm washcloth. But science has, you know, really disproven that that is very effective for our patients because not only does the temperature matter, but we'll show you that the duration of heat matters as well. But with temperature, you really want to be achieving this 102 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's because if you think about what you're doing to warm the lid, you, you know, you want to be warming the meibomian glands, which are not superficial completely to the eyelid skin on a, of a closed eye. You have to heat through skin, muscle, blood vessels, and some fat actually to achieve that inner lid temperature that we want to see the mybum start to thin. So temperature matters. And so finding a mask that heats safely to this, you know, 102 to 110 range is, is important. And duration matters. Um, you know, the, the problem with a lot of the microwave masks is that they do 
uh, cool off within that four to five minute range. And that might be okay for your mild MGD patient, but it's not enough for your, your moderate to severe MGD patient. They need 15 minutes or more. And it's just like what Leslie said, that heat has to go through uh, quite a long distance, a lot longer than it seems to get to the, the meibomian glands to do the job. So, you know, I do think about that magic in the duration and, and I do tell patients that when I'm doing an entry level mask that I want them heating for the six to 10 minutes. But as soon as I start to see more moderate changes to the glands, whether it's structural or function, I'm really looking for an, an extended duration mask because I know that it takes longer. The melting point of the mybum is actually higher for patients who have um, more advanced meibomian gland dysfunction. So we need a longer duration heat for a longer amount of time. And the moist heat really makes a, an impact on how you're able to conduct heat through these layers that we are talking about to achieve that temperature at the meibomian gland. Um, if you think about just the difference between moist and dry heat, if you're going to um, put your hand into a boiling pot, it's going to burn, you know, significantly versus if you just put your hand into the hot oven. So, you know, there, you know, there's the difference between just the way the moist and the dry heat works. And there's a lot of science that backs this up. With moist heat, you see a faster transfer through the eyelids to the meibomian glands. The increase in humidity um, also helps to stabilize the tear film. It also increases circulation, so that's thought to promote healing for patients. And you know that that increased blood flow also helps to keep the eyelid skin um, and surrounding tissue healthy. Yeah, and the dry heat's going to do the opposite of that. It's going to pull moisture away from the eyelid, that sensitive skin, and decrease the stability of the tear film. This is going to contribute to dry skin in that periocular uh, orbital area. And then we risk burning the eyelid. Um, and this is my biggest concern when patients are bringing in these plug-in masks and these battery-operated masks is that dry heat and how hot it does get. Um, and I do that. I tell them, I say, bring them in. Let's look at it because some of them are, are going to be adamant about what it is they're using and then I kind of pick it apart and tell them all the reasons why it's not going to be as effective for our goal and that it can be dangerous. And so when you look, I mean, now we kind of are inundated by these entry-level masks that we've been talking about, the ones that are microwavable. Um, some of them are um, I think just kind of air activated. Some of them are the dry heat that are, are plugging in. Um, and it, I don't know what your conversation, Crystal, is with patients, but again, if I have a mild dry eye uh, MGD patient, I am okay using one of these entry-level beaded masks. I, and that's usually to me a patient that when I'm grading the mybum, I'm actually getting a release, you know, from my, um, I do my bomian gland evaluation using the CORB evaluator. And if I can actually get oil to release from the glands, but it's just not all of the glands, then I feel comfortable with an entry level mask. But quite frankly, most of my patients are more in that moderate to advanced where I know I need this 15 to 20 minute heat mask. And these are only around six to 10 minutes. Yeah, same thing with me. Um, I don't have a lot of patients who are not getting the recommendation for the longer duration mask um, because I, I don't see a lot of routine patients. But I can imagine like if you've got contact lens practice that one of the microwave masks would be an, an okay option for them. But for your dry eye patient, I just don't think it's gonna be enough. And because of this research that we've talked about and because of the findings that we're about to show, I think that some of the ones that do make me a little fearful are the, are the plug-in ones. I think that some of them, you know, can heat quite hot. I think 130 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which would be, you know, not ideal. And the other thing that has been interesting over the years is to see just the inconsistency of some of those masks that they can achieve levels that could cause thermal injury to the eye just from microwaving it a few seconds longer in the same microwave. So, you know, you really got to consider those things for patients as well. And although there is moisture being released from a lot of, you know, the beaded masks that will release, it's just not the same as um, some of the longer duration masks. Exactly. Um, so to summarize, yep. what we've got go is we, 
Now, Suzanne, go forward for us on that one. So to summarize, we need 15 to 20 minutes of extended heat. We need sustained temperature between 102, 110 degrees, and we need a humidity of at least 80%. But just as important, we need it to be repeatable. And that's like what you were saying with the microwave ones. You've got the same mass, the same microwave, but if you ask that patient to reheat it after the first five minutes, now all of a sudden everything's gone out the window as far as consistency, and we need it to be safe. That is a great point. I actually just had a patient that I saw recently that was using a beaded mask and she was doing it twice a day, but sort of twice a day back to back and mm -hmm. had no idea that it doesn't heat, you know, as well until it's kind of, you know, several hours after they heat it the first time. So even just educating patients to how they're using these masks so they get the, the most um, repeatable um, type of temperature is important. And safety, of course, is something that we worry about. Well, so when I set out to do, um, you know, and I was so excited to have Crystal on board with this, um, we, I really wanted to look at um, what would happen if I did a, a meibomian gland expression in the office using um, a mask that not only was heating, but actually was vibrating around the orbital bone. So it was going to provide me 20 minutes of heat in the optimal range using this moist humidity type of mask. Um, and I used the Tranquil Vibes mask to do that. And then um, sent the patient home after my Bomian gland expression at the slit lamp um, with something I, we weren't sure about, either a Tranquilize um, XL mask or a Tranquil Vibes mask. And the reason that these two masks were chosen for at-home care was because of some of the things we just were talking about. One, they both achieved this ideal temperature of 102 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. They both achieved the duration, 15 minutes to 20 minutes of heat. They both have the humidity that we were looking for with 80% humidity or higher, um, the consistency and the, and the safety. And so really it was to challenge, you know, how we could optimize an in-office procedure to improve signs and symptoms for our meibomian gland patients. So as Leslie said, we had four sites and I was honored to be one of those. We had 35 patients in total. And during that first visit, we did extensive baseline measurements. We had every single patient, no matter which they eventually got uh, selected to take home, which, which uh, mask they went home with, all of them used the Tranquil Vibes, the vibrating one in the office for 20 minutes. After we took the mask off, we immediately did gland expression. And then they were randomized as to taking home the Tranquil Vibes or taking home the Tranquilize XL. And then they, we, uh, they committed to use those masks every single day for 30 days and make little notes and, and re we brought them back in, repeated our measurements, but also we repeated all of the, the surveys and dry eye questionnaires that we'd given them in the beginning. Um, so it was a fun study for patients to be involved with too, because they had, ex you know, a lot of the patients, you know, had it maybe used extended duration masks. So just to really introduce them to the difference between the a beaded mask to something like this. Um, and I will say that when the patients returned, the vibration really added a whole other element of um, comfort and relaxation. And it was exciting to really get to the results because it was um, kind of the first time that I had actually dealt with any kind of vibration and heat simultaneously. So we looked at, like I said, we looked at both signs and symptoms. And for symptoms, we used both the speed questionnaire as well as the DEQ5. And we were really excited to see a significant improvement um, for both of groups. So in the Tranquil Eyes group, which was just the heat without vibration, we saw a 35% decrease in symptoms. And for our, uh, I'm sorry, that's the Tranquil Vibes. And for the Tranquil Eyes group, we saw about a 29% decrease in symptoms. So that's, you know, a third decrease in symptoms in just a month after treatment, which was really encouraging. Well, and similarly with the DEQ5, 37% and 28%. And the thing to, that you'll continually see throughout all of these results is that we had incredible results even with the Tranquilize XL, so the non-vibrating mask. Um, and that was the only difference between the two was the vibrating. And like Leslie said, patients really enjoyed it. I know that uh, as far as 
just their enthusiasm to do the mask day after day. But similar results in both because they met that criteria that we talked about earlier with the duration, the temperature, and the moisture. Um, I was delighted because I'm always excited to improve visual quality for patients as much as I can, you know, and that's a big part of when we're treating my Bomian gland dysfunction. So to see these increases in stability of tears was really exciting. So we had big gains in tear breakup time for our, these patients um, in the Vibes and the XL group, um, 69 and 72% increase. And, and if you look at the numbers, if I have a four or a three and a half, that, that patient on a tear breakup time is really going to have their lifestyle altered. If you're breaking up, you know, within five seconds of a blink, you know, by mid afternoon or early evening, you're certainly going to start noticing that blur or burn or just discomfort with your eyes makes you want to maybe pause from your computer use or just kind of close your eyes to take a break. Once I start getting this seven seconds at, you know, six and seven seconds, as the closer I'm getting to 10, you know, that's, that is going to optimize vision for patients, increase the um, tear stability and, and um, make the patients more comfortable longer into the day. So these were um, big, big wins in my mind for, for this study. And same thing with lysamine green staining, another big win. Now, I think a lot of times lysamine green staining or conjunctival staining, let's say, goes under the radar because we're not putting the lysamine green in. And if you listen to Dr. Karpecki earlier, he said, you know, you can pick that up with fluorescein and a retin filter. So that's another option. Um, but in this case, both the tranquil eyes and the tranquil vibes decrease conjunctival staining. And corneal staining, which um, is also, you know, exciting to see. So this one, I think that we're a little bit, you know, more adept to seeing and um, in tune with. But I agree that conjunctiva and the lysamine staining is really an early detector of, of change. Sometimes you might pick up lysamine on their conjunctiva before you even see the corneal staining. But in order, um, because the stability of the tear film was improved, I would assume that helped to decrease the staining that we saw for these patients. And um, again, pretty significant for both groups. So like we said all along, incredible results for both categories. And yes, in, in the majority of them, we had a bigger um, decrease in, in symptoms and signs with the tranquil vibes versus the tranquil XL, tranquilized XL, but incredible results in both. And it's because it meets those requirements that we talked about, but reduction in speed, uh, speed symptoms, DEQ5 symptoms, increase in T-butt, decrease in both conjunctival and corneal staining. You know, and now I think the way that I'm using this in my clinic now is to perform in-office procedures using a mask, and then I actually can send the patient home with the mask I use to do the treatment. It makes my Bomian gland expression a lot easier than any kind of cold expression, you know, obviously warming the glands and um, achieving that um, thinner mybum helps you push out that secretion, which is going to improve um, symptoms for your patients and also the stability of the tear. So I think it's a great way to kind of adapt the study for, you know, your own clinic is to use these masks as your in-office way of doing my and gland expression and then sending the patient home to continue care. Yeah, what we do is we use the Tranquil Vibes in the office. So it's not the one that they necessarily chose to take home. A lot of them are taking home the Tranquil Eyes XL, but I made my little relaxation room and told patients anytime they want, they can come by, have a seat, we close the curtains and just sit, relax with their tranquil vibes. And it doesn't increase chair time because this has nothing to do with their appointment time. They're gonna come in before that and then we're gonna pull them back and do the expression just like it would have done anyway. I like this relaxation room. <laughs> That's a great idea. There's some COVID modifications, but it's been nice. <laughs> yeah. Super. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited, obviously, about this information. And I think that what another really um, important part of it is that it's, it's if you're doing just manual gland expression, even just something, there's something you can be doing for these moderate to severe MGD patients now that now is clinically proven. 
to help improve signs and symptoms. So we're going to continue uh, on to the second half of this. And um, we're going to uh, thank you very much, Drs. O'Dell and Brimer for everything you did in this study. And we're going to be bringing back Dr. Perriman, hopefully Dr. Now, if she was able to join us. Um, and then we're gonna continue on a, a discussion of something that I think you're going to find very, very interesting, which is all about nocturnal evaporative stress. So Dr. Perriman, how are you? I loved your data, strong work on that study. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I employ these techniques in practice and I just really appreciate your awesome data that you, you. generated for us. That's good, good job. Okay, so nighttime. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Perryman. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, so nighttime considerations. Have you ever had that dry patient that's not getting better with your perfectly laid out plan and you start asking them more questions and then they'll admit to you, well, I've always uh, woken up early, like first light wakes me up or my eyes feel terrible first thing in the morning. I have to put drops in to get them going. Think about nighttime evaporative stress. This, uh, this, these are gross examples, meaning you know, frank examples of nocturnal leg ophthalmos. And that has a consequence for the poor cornea and the ocular tissues that nightly, hopefully eight hours of sleep where you have incomplete lid closure, e exposure of the ocular tissues, that is ongoing desiccating stress, night after night after night. And everybody knows that desiccating stress is an independent driver of chronic inflammation with dry eye disease. So without the adequate protection of our eyelids, without the mechanical protection of these windshield wipers Mother Nature blessed us with, we have inadequate protection of the eyes at night. And some severe cases may be surgical, uh, gold weights, mid-face lifts, fillers, tear trap fillers, mid-face fillers, um, you name it. But what about those subtle cases? What about those pre-surgical cases? What about those subtle cases? And my index, when I first read some of the papers that we're going to share with you in a minute, I thought that is one, that's actually, I take it back, it's the most easily to integrate clinical pearl that I've ever received. And so it's my favorite one to pass along to others is the how to look for lid seal insufficiency. So how do we diagnose this? Um, make sure we're all accustomed to being at the slit lamp and getting our stains out and then looking at the eye up close like this under the slit lamp, right? But don't forget to look at this whole area. Don't forget to look at the entire person. You'll start to see little clues. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so this paper was uh, a wonderful addition to my clinical uh, fund of knowledge. And this is a, core by, a paper by Corbin Blackie and they described compromised lid seal in patients with refractory dry eye disease and asymptomatics. And when you, when you learn to identify this lid seal insufficiency, I think it will, and knowing that there's such easy thing we can do about it, I think you'll uh, be more successful in your dry eye practice. So in this particular paper, there were two different populations, uh, very symptomatic patients that have failed everything and patients that weren't symptomatic yet, right? It's coming, we all know it's coming. So we wanna catch that before that point. Uh, they did the CORB, Blackie light test, and I'll explain that in a second. And it was a scale from zero to three. Zero is a nice complete lid closure. And three is there's definite light escaping under the door there. And how they did it, and this is how I would encourage you to do it, is take your humble muscle light that's just sitting there waiting the vast majority of the time in your, in your stand by your slit lamp. Take your little muscle light. I, all I have is a pen light today. Ask the patient to close their eyes and relax their face, right? Your older patients are still overacting their brow because of ptosis, right? They're, they're, ask them to relax their whole face. Take that light in a darkened room and shine it right at the superior sulcus, superior tarsus pointing down at the interpalpebral fissure. I don't know if you can see it, but I have an in inefficient lid seal. And I wear a mask every single night. Helps me tremendously. In this paper, 80% uh, had a compromised lid seal, um, a one or two or a three. And um, the asymptomatic group, very few of them had this lid seal insufficiency. And I think if you go on to the next slide, I hope, 
oh, there's a corollary to that. Yeah, that's okay. You can keep going. I wanted to say there was a follow-up paper where they then went on to describe a um, this lid seal insufficiency as being a risk factor for my bobian gland dropout. And so be on the observational lookout for cases of significantly asymmetric my booming gland dropout on your mybomography. We use infrared mybomography on every single patient. But when you see a, a marked asymmetry, make sure you didn't overlook your light seal insufficiency test. It's amazing how many times that really does correlate with it. You can catch it in young people too. I've caught it in college kids, younger kids. So it's um, make sure you think about it. But um, one of the things I want to talk about when it comes to lid seal insufficiency is not only how you know, Mother Nature puts your face together, but there's, you know, downward tractional forces with gravity and aging birthdays. There's breathing apparatus issues that happen at night. When you're asleep, your brainstem loses the tone in your oropharynx. And that oropharynx can then collapse back into the back of your throat, creating a temporary obstruction. Well, the oxygen levels then start to go down and that's called hypoxia. And the hypoxia wakes up your primitive part of your brain that's responsible for respiratory drive. <sighs> oh, oh, I need to breathe. And so the consequence of that is you never get into deep stage four sleep. It used to be that you had to go to a sleep center for that. Thankfully, you have, there are kits that uh, patients check out and take home. There are Fitbits and uh, Apple Watch type fitness type devices where you can ask your patients to screen themselves for snoring and inadequate deep sleep. The solution to it is still CPAP, right? So CPAP helps to maintain a bit of positive pressure so that if there's that, that temporary obstruction in the back of the oropharynx, you can still push some air past it and eliminate those hypoxic episodes, which prevents those wakeful periods just enough to start breathing again. And then you go back to a deeper sleep, you block and the cycle repeats itself. There's a consequence to all that hypoxia. Go on to the next slide and go one more. There's a consequence to this and it's called floppy eyelid syndrome, which you know, we probably need to come up with a more flattering term, but <laughs> we're stuck with floppy eyelid syndrome as it is for now. And sometimes I'll miss it until I go to do the dilated exam. And then you've got your, your indirect there and you pull the lid back and you're like, hold up, why can I pull that lid so far? Let me look a little closer. Oh yeah, there's a little bit of temporal lash ptosis. Look again at the slit lamp. Oh, I see a little bit of a papillary conjunctivitis change. There's some lacrimal gland herniation there. Those are all physical exam findings consistent with floppy eyelid syndrome. Be on the lookout for it. It's not just an old, overweight, former linebacker's disease. I've seen teeny tiny women with this as well. So you can't make gender or weight-based assumptions about obstructive sleep apnea. If you identify floppy eyelid syndrome in your dry eye patient, understand that the windshield wipers responsible for protecting the eye, responsible for blinking, or spreading the tears across the eye is abnormal. There's a mechanical aspect to this dry eye. You know me, I'm always talking about the immunologic aspects of dry eye, but this is a mechanical driver to the problem and we have to learn to recognize it. Um, the uh, correlation between floppy eyelid syndrome and obstructive sleep apnea is in the 90 plus percentile. In the reverse, only about a quarter of OSA, obstructive sleep apnea patients have floppy eyelid syndrome. So what we think is happening is the chronic hypoxic episodes create an ischemic injury around the muscle of Riolan, which is surrounds the meibomian glands and is responsible for that tiny bit of squeeze of meibom with blinking and forceful closure. The, those are, so those are abnormal and weakened from chronic hypoxic injury. And also the hypoxic injury is associated with very high levels of MMP9. And that's responsible for the breakdown of the, of the elastin in your tissues. And that's where you get the floppy lax lids instead of the nice normal tone and uh, texture ones that we need in order to protect our eye when we're sleeping. Next slide. So there's, again, there's lots and lots of causes of it. It could be the way we're born, right? If you, if you have a lot of uh, uh, you know, tonsil disease and your kid maybe sleep with your mouth open, the face is longer, this is a little short so that lower lid doesn't come up as high as it needs to. I've seen blepharoplasties, beautiful cosmetic result, short sheet of the bed, and now we've got an exposure issue. We can soften that scar and improve things with IPL, but we also need to protect those eyes with a 
silicone vaulted ceiling night mask. Thyroidoid disease as the proptosis gets worse, as the lid stiffens from all of that um, uh, extracellular matrix proliferation, then we uh, can't, uh, there's somebody knocking at the door. I can't answer the phone, I'm so sorry. And this is live, isn't it? Sorry guys, okay. Hi, <laughs> myopia, then I'm all you know, coming forward. Trauma to the eyelid, of course. Overaggressive Botox, be careful with your Botox, right? So you wanna make sure that your Botox patients are not receiving Botox here. This weakens the abicularis, weakens the ability for lid seal, also gets uptaken by the lacrimal gland and directly decreases lacrimal gland output. No Botox here. Um, and then finally, we've got just the effect of gravity over time. Next slide. We've got lots of options. Uh, back in the day, I used to use these neoprene vaulted ones, but they get a little swampy. They get a little mm, nasty over time because the bacteria, they're not, they're hard to clean. So I went away from those as soon as I found these silicone vaulted ones. You still need to wash it every single day, but it's so much easier to get it clean than these fabric-based ones. And the vaulted design is great because the fabric ones, I've seen cases of corneal abrasion at night from wearing the fabric flat masks and that eye opening just a little bit and creating an abrasion. We, we want to avoid that. And let's see, and a lot of people do that. To, anyway, humidity is created to the ocular surface. We all know that. Uh, we want to keep the moisture there, slow down the evaporative load, maximize the function of those precious meibomian glands. Um, it's all part of the game in addressing dry disease. It's such a big diagnosis. And really, if you start listening for these little clues and just incorporating a 10 second additional thing in your physical exam, you're going to identify some of the nightly stressors that are getting in the way between your patient's relief and success and your satisfaction with dry disease. Easy thing to do. Patients are so relieved when I say, oh, this is a $60 fix. Um, don't recommend swim goggles unless, you know, your marriage isn't doing great. Um, the saran wrap method. <laughs> the saran wrap method. I don't recommend that either. I've had patients come in with their uh, skin completely, like they've been sitting in a hot tub all night long. You know how the skin gets really friable um, and uh, over overhydrated. That's what happens when you have a, a, a totally occlusive dressing. So the saran wrap is not a great thing. Ointments can dry out and create irritation. I'm not a fan of ointment. Highly recommend you avoid Miro for this application. That adds to the desiccating hyperosmolar stress. No Miro. Next slide. I love these masks. So I keep them in the clinic and I have the patient try them on. Uh, they're compatible with CPAP use. If you don't have sleep apnea and just have a simple inefficient lid seal, it's brilliant for recreating that protective environment for that precious cornea and ocular surface tissues. And it's affordable. You can side sleep, you can stomach sleep, and it's not going to raccoon you. It's not going to push and pressure and give you a corneal abrasion. Um, and patients adapt to it very, very well. Next slide. Oh, and clear and dark. So I live way up in the north, in the Pacific Northwest, right? So the dark ones are for summer solstice time when it gets light at 4.30, and the clear ones are at winter solstice time when it gets dark at 4.30. <laughs> Next slide. Well, that's, that's it. Just some final thoughts. We're going to bring the um, in time. Thank you so much, Dr. Perriman, for all of that. <laughs> uh, I think that it's one of those things where it, I, I've, I have black ophthalmists myself, and I and there's no way yes. I can sleep without the eyes of 4.0 <laughs> every night. But I, um, every night. And I think that, you know, I do like the clear. Um, and there's also a lovely line of colors that I have fun with, like the hot pink and the green <laughs> and the lavender. Like, it's very fun to think about, you know, and the patients appreciate, even though they'll say, who's going to see this? You know, I can't see it, but um, it, it's kind of nice to have something that's a little fun color. I love it. <laughs> Suzanne, we should find a line of uh, printed silk pajamas that pick up all the different colors that you there can you like so be coordinated. We, yeah, we used to say that a long time ago. To just pick your with just the original tranquilize back in 2003, it was like, well, why are there colors? Do not your pajamas, you know? <laughs> why not? And then we have a lot of people that want the bright pink ones so that they can find them easier when they, if they fall off in the middle of the night. So, oh, that's were, clever. I didn't know why they were hot pink, but I really like the hot pink. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to go to live Q&A, um, and we've got a lot of them. I'm going to direct this one um, to, I guess, a Dr. Odell, who is a leading investigator with the clinical study regarding the first half of the discussion. 
uh, how was the uh, tear the tear breakup time measured, uh, fluorescein or with uh, NIBUT, the NIBUT? Um, I think it, well, Crystal, if I don't, mm -hmm. if I'm not wrong, you actually were able to do NICBUT um, mm -hmm. on your patients, but we all did also the fluorescein tear breakup time. At the time of the study, I didn't have access to non-invasive tear breakup time. So mine were, were with fluorescein. And I think that Crystal had both in her, what she gave us as far as data was both the non-invasive and the fluorescein tear breakup. True. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, then well, another question, I'll just put this out to uh, everybody and maybe um, Dr. Brimer, you can handle this one. Uh, how often can you manually express uh, mybobian glands per year? I don't, is there a limit? Um, I mean, basically every patient that I see every day, I express glands. Now I'm not doing it therapeutically. I'm doing it diagnostically just to see what's our status. And they expect that. They expect me to debride the lid and to, to do a, a quick expression because then that's telling us how are we doing on our anti-inflammatory, on our systemic control, on our supplements. Do we need to make any adjustments so that we can thin out this myvum? Um, okay. Any opinion on that, Laura, Leslie? I think that, you know, if I'm thinking about therapeutic, if that maybe is how that question is coming in, I don't know that there is a limit. I feel like I'm doing treatments and expression until I can yield clear my bum. So mm -hmm. I feel like what you see coming out of the glands kind of becomes the, the way that you know when to maybe cease Stop. treatments or that you've kind of achieved your success. I find that sometimes doctors will, will say something failed as far as any kind of expression, but I feel like they also don't have a good starting point that they then use as a reference point after, and they just go solely on what the patient's telling them. So I think the best thing that you can do is, is use what you're saying, Crystal, with you know what's coming out of the gland and invisibly seeing the mybum and use that and see the change go from thickened mybum, toothpaste quality back to olive oil. You now know you're making an improvement in the, in the function. Yeah, that's one of the best things I did was when I was um, customizing my EMR, I've got radio buttons now where I, I document the amount of oil coming out, but also the consistency. And so then I am, I'm able to get excited with that patient and tell them, oh my gosh, we just, we just upgraded you two clicks on each eye. Um, and, and that means something to them. It kind of gives them permission to feel better. Yeah. Um, any thoughts? We have a little victory dance when we get uh, olive oil back. We, everybody's just like, exactly. Woo! <laughs> we try to capture it on video and show the patient like, I have the oil. It's like, yes, you have oil. <laughs> I love it. That's what this one, we hear this a lot at IECO all the time about the, um, the patient because the, the way that we package the, the product, the Tranquil Vibes, which is available. Some question was, is it available for purchase? Yes, it is in office or at home. And then the XL also, the, the, the difference in the retail prices, sometimes, you know, if you go look the entry level, they're usually 20, 25 bucks. If you're jumping to something that's now $80 retail, how do you overcome that? that circumstance, and I always say, I'd love your feedback, but I always say, well, really, if you cost it out per application, you're looking at difference of pennies per application. Like it's, you know, 14 cents per use for your ones that get 180 uses out of them. And for like the advanced kit, Tranquilize XL advanced kit is 15 cents per use. So you really need to put it in the context of the number of applications, but I would love your feedback and just your experience. And I'd also say that really the, the, the rubber, it's, it's where the rubber meets the road. If patients start feeling better faster, then the compliance goes way up. And to me, it's, we've always said for 18 years, everything we can do for compliance is what we're up to. So I'd love your thoughts on that. Maybe. Sorry, I, I always talk about value, not cost, and they're gonna get a quicker, bigger return. And when they are investing, not just dollars, but minutes per day, all of a sudden it matters. I say, I don't want you going through the motions and thinking you're doing a good thing. And here we, we've wasted two months and you come back and we haven't gone anywhere because it wasn't enough. Um, and that seems to resonate. That's great advice. Dr. Odell, thoughts on that? Um, I, I actually sometimes do use, I like that idea of using value, not cost. Um, 
I, I sometimes do break it down though into what you said earlier, you know, 15 cents a day with the Excel mask, just because, um, well, honestly, because sometimes they're leaving and they're not just purchasing a mask at the time of checkout, they're purchasing a cleanser or they're purchasing some kind of um, omega supplement as well. And I will say though that patients are, they want something that works. I think a lot of times when they're coming to one of us, you know, they're willing to try something that we're recommending because they've been through other treatments that haven't yielded success. But I think it's, you know, even in a doctor that's not a tertiary kind of referral setter for dry eye, these masks are, are not really not really a sell. You're really just providing a better service to the patient, right? So if you're if you're doing a beaded mask for moderate to advanced MGD, you're not going to see the results like like Crystal's saying. You're not going to see that in two and three months because you need that increased um, duration and a longer heat um, and that moist heat. So I think if you really want to be treating MGD, you need to think about it like stages, and you need to know that you need different tools for different stages. Super. Any thoughts, Dr. Perman? Oh, I, I love that discussion. I love that approach. And it's um, my general philosophy is to give them the tools they need to get the job done and help them celebrate all those little victories. And if you can, if you can get create a temporal relationship between the intervention and feeling better, that's a driver for um, adherence to therapy and success with therapy. All of this, these approaches work. We just um, trying to create that connection and understanding in our patients. Oh, I love it. That's wonderful. That was like last August last year, right? With that, when Doctors Corbin now did their their lecture on the paradigm shift, and it's really taking these this approach of the patient can has the ability to do things now at home that they couldn't even do five years ago, and same thing in practice in office. And when you marry those two, and you're working in partnership, it's magic. And it's getting the right the right products for the right person, the right treatment in office. Um, another one, and this is this would be interesting. What percentage of your um, moderate to severe MGD patients that you see also have nocturnal evaporative stress? Um, Dr. Perman? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty high. <laughs> I, I haven't tracked the actual number, but I'm more often surprised when I don't see lid seal insufficiency mm -hmm. in the severe patient than when I do if that makes sense. And to your, to your last point about, um, you know, putting more tools in the patient's hands and creating uh, understanding about it, I just, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you do in creating these excellent tools that patients can use at home. But also there's a, a series of online videos that this team has put together that patients really appreciate being able to see. So there's, there's resources out there, patients can look for stuff. You can help save you chair time, our, our dear colleagues. Um, lean on these resources. Um, we've had patients come on and tell their story and the different things that they've used and what's worked for them. And this, we've gotten a lot of good feedback from the entire series. You can find it on YouTube and it's all, there's also links on the IECO site. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and I would love to hear with the, the Drs. Odell and Brimer about the, the um, nocturnal back to compare the, just the correlation. But on that note, I said thank you for bringing that up. We're really passionate about our uh, patient educational series that we started six months ago and incredibly fortunate to have these the four doctors on the panel, expert panel, direct to patient. And the, the content is something that your patients will really appreciate because now it's not just you saying it. You're hearing other, they're hearing other doctors say it, other dry eye experts saying it. And it's it's um it's really wonderful. So we're gonna we we're gonna get back into that again back in May. We started back in October. So thanks for bringing that up, uh, doctors Brimer and Odell. Any comments or thoughts about just the correlation? Like when you're seeing that moderate to severe, you're always looking for the the NES, the nocturnal evaporative stress. And are you seeing the same thing that Dr. Perriman is the majority? I am, and I I am adamant about looking in every single patient. Um, and then correlating it to uh, one of my uh, questions on my dry eye questionnaire is, how do you feel when you first wake up in the morning? And then in parentheses, it says, still lying in bed <laughs> when the alarm clock goes off. That's what I want to know. Or I'll say, if you get up in the middle of the night, how do your eyes feel? And then we talk through it reasonably and say, okay, you should wake up feeling your best. There is no dry eye in a closed eye environment. 
So let's walk through what are the possible reasons for you to wake up uncomfortable and just kind of help them reach the same conclusion. Um, and I definitely use the transilluminator and not only with the, the core blackie technique, but also as I'm coming at them with the transilluminator, I'm looking at the seal to see if I can see some little tear foam glistening. And that helps me identify it much quicker. And then I go ahead with the core blackie method and, and just compare my results between the two, but very, very high correlation. Wonderful, okay. Well, not wonderful, but it's wonderful that we have the tools <laughs> to be able to look for that now and then the solutions for them, because it's really, it's something. I, I think that it's one of the, it's a high, highly overlooked area of the vapor stress at night. The, um, another question this way. I agree, but if you look at the study that Dr. Perryman was talking about, you know, it's such an overlooked um, thing, but it's such a powerful one. 80% mm -hmm. of patients that are resisting, you know, responding to our topical therapies as we want them to have a, an inadequate lid seal and just identifying it and giving them the tools they need to help make that environment less of a, a, a dry eye environment overnight is, is really life-changing for patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well said. Um, there's another, this is a, for rosacea patients with MGD, do you modify your, um, your hot compress protocol? Um, I don't know who wants to take that one on. Dr. Perrin? <laughs> sure, I'll take it. Okay. So it's not uncommon for patients with significant uncontrolled rosacea to report that the hot packs um, are not as soothing as, as other as they would expect and other patients have reported. And really, if you bring the rosacea under control with your dietary approach, we recommend the Whole30. With your omega supplementation, we recommend Hydra-I. With your uh, immunomodulatory controls and also with IPL treatments, then as that element comes under control, then they tolerate the hot therapy uh, much, much better. And you're able to get that aspect controlled as well. Wonderful. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, and then this one was, it's kind of, it's not related necessarily to what we discussed, but it, I may as well put it out there too, but, cause I think it's probably common. Uh, what, um, what do each of you like uh, to easily debride the lid? I, I use the Carpecki debrider um, and the laugh had nothing to do with that, except I had it in my little brooder pot. They have a little hot pot that the bees get 450 degrees and I had it uh, sanitizing in there and I grabbed it and dropped it on my leg. It's oh. been three weeks and I have these two burn marks on my thigh in the shape of the Carpecki debrider. <laughs> so. It does get really hot actually. I feel bad for you. <laughs> Um, I also use Carpecki, but I've, I've also used, um, uh, Dr. Epstein has a debrider as well. So I've kind of go back and forth between the, those two and a foreign body spud as well. Right. I use well, a Chalazin Curette and an Epstein debrider, and I would love to try the Carpecki debrider too. Yeah. There There's a disposable one now called the eye stick, the lid stick. Um, and that's nice because in COVID world, it's so nice to be able to have a brand new something oh. and throw it away. <laughs> Perfect. I use Actually, the that's a good stick, point, but I didn't use kit. it for the, I don't use it to debride. Do you use the white, hard plastic oh. side? It's yeah, so it's shaped like a half moon it's and it's six flat hard. I think mm -hmm. we're getting cut off. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, wonderful panel, for all of your expertise. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the event. Take care.